Hello, welcome, I'm your host, Mr. McMahon. Uh, I'm going to go through maybe about half of these problems, and I'll post the rest of them later. Otherwise, this video will be like an hour long, and I don't think anyone wants that. So, uh, I'll maybe do about half of these derivatives, integrals, couple from this natural log technique, maybe two problems from this inverse function section, uh, some u sub, maybe a few of those, maybe one trig substitution, a couple l'hopitals, and then we have a little application here. Always gotta, always gotta apply this stuff, right? So let's go back to the front. Oh, a couple changes too. Um, this 21 was supposed to be a 2x, otherwise you actually can't integrate it, as far as what you guys know. And another, uh, let's see, another thing you need to change is this pi, this pi over 2 to pi, right? Otherwise, this integral, you can't integrate it. So, anyway, let's get started. Let's, let's just start with this one. So, 2 tangent x secant x. Now, there's not really a substitution you're supposed to make here um, <clears throat> because, well, if you try to make a substitution, it's not going to work. You need to rely on just your basic derivatives that you should know. Like from your stuff, you must know cold sheet. This is one of them, right? You should know what that, the, that is the derivative of. Uh, let me go ahead and pull out the 2 as well because I know that 2 is not part of the derivative of what I'm thinking of. Tangent x secant x is the, is the derivative of secant x, right? So that means the antiderivative here is just secant of x from 0 to pi. Now remember what secant is, right? This might make it easier to see what our answer should be. I'll, I'll rewrite it. It's 1 over cosine. So that might help to rewrite it like that. And so when I'm calculating this out, I have 2, 1 over cosine pi, minus 1 over cosine of 0. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Cosine of 0 is 1. Right, so really, this is just 2 times negative 2, which is negative 4. Right, so negative 4... <laughs> is your answer here. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, the natural log of the square root of t. We're taking a derivative with respect to t. Okay, so <clears throat> remember our outer and inner function, my outer is the natural log and my inner is the square root of t. Just remember when you do the chain rule here, right? You do the derivative of the outside, which in this case is going to look like this, but then the inside stays the same, right? So this is going down here. And then you multiply by the derivative of this inner one, right? So the derivative there is going to be 1 half times t to the negative 1 half, right? So what you should end up with is... 1 over 2 square root of t times square root of t. All right, we got two of them now. And when you multiply those together, you should definitely simplify that. All right, you get 1 over 2t. And that is our derivative. If you know your natural log rules, you can also find the derivative this other way. All right? Think of your natural log rules. You could also rewrite that as 1 half times the natural log of t. Because this is t to the 1 half power, and that power, if you know your natural log rules, can go out front there. And we get the same exact answer, right? So it should make sense either way you do it. It should be the same thing. <laughs> All right, let's do this integral here. Um, I saw a lot of mistakes on this type of integral on the quiz. A lot of people, a lot of people, when they did the antiderivative here, just sort of left it exactly the same. That's not quite true. That's like half of the truth, right? But you need to counteract the chain rule. So you need to have this division by negative 4 in your antiderivative. You have to have that. 
okay? And so what does this turn into? Um, might be helpful to sort of rewrite this a bit before I do the, the fundamental theorem here. So this is going to be 1 over, or sorry, negative 1 over 4 e to the 4t. That's maybe a slightly better way to write it. So when I do the fundamental theorem, I get something minus something. Okay, this first one is negative 1 over 4 e to the 12. And this one over here is negative 1 over 4 e to the 4. And you should have two negatives there. If you do not have two negatives, you did this wrong. Because remember, this negative came from the fundamental theorem. These two negatives are just a part of the antiderivative. Right? So both should be accounted for. <clears throat> so that turns into a plus, And it looks like we end up with negative 1 over 4 e to the 12 plus 1 over 4 e to the 4. And you can just leave this by exactly how it is, because this is the section where you won't have a calculator. So just leave that alone. Uh, let's do this derivative here. If you're not quite seeing how to do this, it might be better to rewrite it, right? Rewrite it in a way that makes it more obvious what you're supposed to do. Well, I know that cosine cube can also be written like that, right? And so I can easily see, oh, the cubing, that's my outer function. So I'm doing a chain rule problem here. So when I do the chain rule, and I also have multiple layers, so I'm going to have to use the chain rule twice. So keep track of everything, right? So first, I'm going to do the power rule on the outside, right? And you remember, you keep the inside the same, right? So this is going to stay the same. And then times the derivative of the inside. Well, now, now I'm doing a chain rule just on this portion. Right, so, again, do the derivative of the outside, keep the inside the same. So that's going to be negative sine of 2x. And then times the derivative of just the inside. So that's going to give me a 2 there, times 2. And so, when I put all this together, I have 3 times negative 2, that's negative 6. Looks like I have a cosine squared of 2x, and I have a sine of 2x. And that is my full answer. So chain rule, if you got multiple layers going on, can be kind of tricky. Just make sure to keep track of what layer you're on. <laughs> okay, we have a integral here. And no, the answer is... The antiderivative is not going to be a natural log, right? Let me go ahead and rewrite this so it's more obvious. You can always rewrite your integrand in a way that makes more sense. This is x to the negative 1 half. Ah, okay. That should make a lot more sense, right? This is an anti-power rule problem. Remember, natural log is only the antiderivative if this power is negative 1. That is the only time. Everything else, you use the anti-power rule. So my antiderivative is going to be 2 x to the positive 1 half divided by positive 1 half. And we're going from 4 to 9. Okay, again, try to rewrite your antiderivative before you evaluate the boundary numbers, right? So 2 divided by 1 half is 4, and we have the square root of x here, right? That's a lot easier to work with, a lot easier on the eyes. So now we have 4 square root of 9 minus 4 square root of 4. So this is going to be 4 times 3 minus 4 times 2. Okay, that's 12 minus 8, which is 4. There we go. So that's all I'm going to do for this section. All right, we've got to keep moving on. 
I'll post the rest of the solutions later. I think I'm going to go ahead and do maybe this one and maybe this one. So for the natural log technique, remember the numerator of your integrand, this guy, has to be exactly the derivative of the denominator, right? And if it doesn't look exactly like the derivative, then you need to change it. Right, so keep in mind, the derivative of the denominator is negative sine. Right, so we need to do two things. We need to pull out the 2 in front of the integral. And we also need to sort of multiply by negative 1 two times. So we can multiply by negative 1 here and on the inside. And... We can do that because negative 1 times negative 1 is just times 1, right? If you multiply by 1, it doesn't change anything. So make sure if you do something to your integrand, you counteract it with something else. And so now I can pretty easily see, I can use the natural log technique, right? Now we can actually use it. So my antiderivative is negative 2 natural log of 1 plus cosine of x, and this is going from 0 to pi over 2. So what do we get? Well, the first thing we have is negative 2 natural log of 1 plus cosine of pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so we just have the natural log of 1. All right, what do we get for the second? negative 2 times natural log of 1 plus cosine of 0, that's going to be 2, right? And one thing you should definitely know is that the natural log of 1 is 0. So this whole first term turns into 0. These two negatives turn into a plus, and so we have plus 2 natural log of 2. You can get rid of the absolute value bars here because 2 is obviously positive, so we don't need them. So the final answer is 2 natural log of 2. Feel free to pause and rewind the video if I'm ever going too fast. Again, I just don't want this video to be an hour long. Let's go ahead and do this one. Uh, again, make sure, right, the derivative of the top, sorry, of the bottom is exactly what the top is. That's not the case here. All right, so one thing we can do is we can sort of pull out a 5. Right? And make this into a 2. So the reason why I'm doing that, right, the derivative of this bottom part is the top now, right? You should have a 2 there because of the chain rule. That's what we want, right? That's what we're looking for. So make that happen. Make it happen. So now this is going to be 5, 5 times the natural log of the bottom from 1 to 5. And now I just plug in 5, plug in 1, and subtract them. Right, so my final answer is 5 natural log of 1 plus e to the 10 minus 5 natural log of 1 plus e to the 2. And you might be wondering, can we simplify that? Um, not really. Not really. I mean, you could use some natural log rules. You could pull out the 5, but... We can't really get a just a single number for an answer here. We have to leave it alone. So that's as far as we can go on that one. And I'll leave this middle one to you guys. All right. I think in this case, I'll go ahead and do maybe these two. I'll do those two. Um, <clears throat> so we have f of x equals the fifth root of 2x plus 2. And in this case, I can actually find the inverse, right? So I'm going to actually go ahead and do that. So I'm going to replace the f of x with x. And this is going to become 2y plus 2, right? Swap the x and the y. 
and let's go ahead and solve for y. So what do we do first? We take the fifth power of both sides. Then we subtract the 2. And then we divide by 2. And so we get a final answer of that g of x, the inverse, is x to the fifth minus 2 divided by 2. And I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this so it's easier to take the derivative. It's going to be 1 half x to the fifth minus 1. So let's take a derivative. We have 5 over 2 x to the fourth. Right, just use the power rule there, and that, that's the derivative, okay? So now let's just plug in 2. 5 over 2, 2 to the fourth. Well, if you simplify all that, right, one of these 2s cancels with 1 up here, so we have 2 to the 3 now. That's 5 times 8, which is 40. Now, you could do this a completely different way. All right. Keep in mind, we could also use the formula. What is the formula? Well, it tells us this. Right? G prime of x equals 1 over f prime of g of x. And we have g of x, right? So we can use this thing. So if you want to use the formula, it's very, very similar. Um, it's going to be 1 over, now, f prime, f prime. Um, let's leave off the f prime for now, because otherwise this is going to get very complicated. And let's just, let's just worry about that inner part, g of 2. Well, remember, if f takes you from 15 to 2, g takes you from 2 to 15. Right. And so this is really just equal to 1 over f prime of 15. Notice how this way you don't necessarily need to have the g function. Right. So now we're just doing f prime of 15. Well, what is f prime? Let's take a derivative. Right. f prime of x equals. Now, if you do this derivative, you get 1 fifth 2x plus 2 the negative 4 fifths times 2. And so just to write this a little better, this is 2 over 5 times 2x plus 2 to the 4 fifths. <coughs> and so f prime of 15 is going to be 2 over 5. Now 2x plus 2, if I plug in 15 there, I get 32 to the four fifths. Well, if you do the fifth power for the one fifth portion there first, you get two over five times two to the fourth, right? Two is the fifth root of 32. Two to the fifth power is equal to 32. So the fifth root of 32 is two. Two to the fourth power is 16. So we'll get five times 16 there. Okay, 5 times 16 is 80, so we have 2 over 80. And look at that. What do you know, right? We end up with... Da, 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 da. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Oh, I, I did something slightly off here, right? This... Um, yeah, I did something a little, little off here. This is supposed to be to the negative four-fifths, right? Yeah, it looks like uh, my f prime, right? Notice how this is in the bottom. So really, when I copied it originally over here, I had it upside down, right? Notice how we're getting 1 over 40? Let me go ahead and, and sort of redo this here, right? 1 over f prime of 15 should look like this, right? 5 times 32 to the 4 fifths over 2, right? So we get the same, same sort of numbers here, just sort of flipped upside down. It's my mistake, my mistake.
we still get the same answer, right? 40. So these are, I know that seemed more harder to do, but it's actually the better way to do the next problem, right? So g prime of pi minus 1, right, what do we do with that? We have to use the formula here. There's no other option. If you try to invert this, well, you get something like this. And there is no algebra technique on Earth that will help you solve for y there. There's, it doesn't exist. Right. So we have to use other means. g prime of pi minus 1 is going to be equal to 1 over f prime of g of pi minus 1. Okay, well, if f takes you from pi to pi minus 1, g takes you from pi minus 1 to pi. So this is equal to 1 over f prime of pi. And what is f prime of pi? Well, i got to take a derivative, right? What is f prime of x? Well, it's going to be 1 plus, well, not necessarily plus, actually, right? Minus sine of x. So that means f prime of pi is going to be 1 minus sine of pi. Sine of pi is 0. So this is equal to 1. And so we have 1 divided by 1, which is 1. Cool. Let me keep going here. U sub, U sub, good old U sub. Let me go ahead and maybe do this one. Uh, I might do this one. And I might do, let me do maybe this one. <laughs> All right. What substitution makes sense here? Well, you want to sub out for something where if you take a derivative, you get something else that's in your integrand. Namely, look at these guys, right? You want to sub out for the higher power. So u equals x to the fourth, right? When you take a derivative, you get 4x cubed. Look at that. We have an x cubed over here. That should make sense, right? So we want to get rid of the 4. Or sorry, we want a 4 to be here, which means if we want a 4 to show up here, we also have to divide by 4 sort of in the integrand, and then I just pull that one-fourth out in front because we don't want it to be part of our antiderivative. So let's see what we got. We know that this is going to be u. We know that this piece right here is going to turn into a du. And so let's see what we get here. We get du over 1 plus u squared. And I have to change my bounds, right? So 1 to the 4th is 1. 3 to the 4th is 81. Yikes. Big number. That's okay. Now, we can just evaluate this integral in the u world, which is a lot easier to do, right? So let me rewrite this just so it's more clear what we're supposed to do. Right? How do I do this? It's not the natural log. If you're thinking the natural log, you are thinking wrong. Right. This is 1 plus u to the negative 2. So this is a case where you have to use the anti-power rule here. Right. Natural log only shows up if this was a negative 1. It's the only, only time. Do not, do not make that mistake on the test, please. It will make me cry. All right, 1 plus u to the negative 2. Let's add 1 to the power. So we have 1 plus u to the negative 1, and then divide by the new power. This is from 1 to 81. Okay, maybe something I might do is I might rewrite this a bit, right, just so it looks a little nicer. Right, this negative 1 over 1 plus u. Right, that's a lot easier to work with. I don't know why you guys leave your antiderivatives like this and try to plug stuff in. You're just going to confuse yourself. Don't do that. That's a bad, bad strategy. So my answer is 
it's going to be negative 1 over 82 minus negative 1 over 2. You got to have both negatives there. Don't make that mistake, right? If your antiderivative is negative, you're going to have two negatives later. You can just take that to the bank. So we have, oh goodness, it's too early to be doing this math. All right. Well, one half is going to be 41 over 82. And here we have minus 1 over 82. All right, so that's going to be 1 fourth times 40 over 82. Okay, that is 10 over 82. That's 5 over 41. That is my answer. Cool. So you have to do a little bit of simplifying there. That's okay. That's okay. Here, let me do this one because we had a little mistake here. Uh, should be in a 2x there, not a 21. Otherwise, you can't even integrate it. You can integrate it numerically with a computer, but you wouldn't be able to get an antiderivative. Right? So what should I substitute here? Not the sign. No. We want to substitute out for x squared. Why? Because the derivative is 2x. That makes a lot more sense. Right? So x equals, sorry, u equals x squared, which means that du equals 2x dx. So I'm going to go ahead. Let's redo our bounds, right? So take these numbers and put them in here. 0 squared is 0, and then square root of pi squared is now pi. Now this piece over here turns into my du. This turns into my u. So all I have left is sine of u du. And that is a nice, nice integral to do, right? The antiderivative here is negative cosine of u from 0 to pi, negative cosine, right? When you take the derivative of this, you should get that. So we should have a negative there. So my answer is negative cosine of pi minus negative, I almost forgot that negative, oh my goodness, minus negative cosine of 0. So this guy is 1. These two turn into a plus. And then negative cosine of pi, right, this guy is negative 1. So we have negative, negative 1. That's positive 1. And then we have a plus, and then we have positive 1. So your final answer should be 2, right, positive 2. If you got negative 2, if you got 0, you are missing a negative sign somewhere. Or you're missing two of them, or you simplified incorrectly. I don't know what you did but I know it had something to do with negative signs, so check your work again. You should have all those negative signs that I have here. All right. Uh, here we got a little trig substitution here. All right, so keep in mind, uh, we can use the formula here. Uh, so we're doing this one, right? And if we get the integral to look like this, and this is a du on top. The antiderivative of that is going to be the inverse sine of u over a plus c, right? So we don't have it like that quite yet. But what can we do to get it to look like that? Well, let's think about it, right? We want to make sure our variable is isolated here. But in this case, we have this 9 out front. We could just pull that 9 out of those two terms, right, and rewrite it like this, 4 ninth minus x squared. This is still inside of the square root, and we have our dx there, right? We're using x's, but you want to think of the x's as the same as the u's here. Still going to work out the same way. Okay, and so now that 9 is going to come out as a 3, right? So this is 
the same thing as one third dx over uh, four ninth four ninths minus x squared inside of a square root. And remember, keep in mind my a squared is four ninths, which means my a is two over three. Right, that's the number that's actually going to go into my formula here. So the antiderivative at the end of the day is going to be one-third inverse sine of, now x divided by two-thirds is going to be 3 over 2x plus a big C. And this is the antiderivative. That is the antiderivative. All right, cool. Let's do some L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule. First, make sure I'm on the test, I think, I'm fairly certain I put this in there, that just by checking which condition it meets, I'm going to give you guys points for determining if this is indeterminate form or if this is infinity over infinity. And then after checking that, right, then you can go ahead and use the rule. Because we learned our lesson the hard way with that FRQ question, right? If you didn't check the condition for L'Hopital's rule on that part C, there was no way you were able to do that problem, right? You were missing out on a lot of points. So we learned our lesson. So anyway, uh, let me go ahead and do maybe this one. Uh, I might do this one. Uh, let's see, maybe, maybe this guy. Let's see, how many do I have? Six? Okay, that's that's three. Yeah, stick with three. So what condition does this meet? Well, think about what ha what's happening with the numerator and denominator. It looks like the numerator is going off towards infinity. This bottom part is also going off towards infinity too. And the square root of infinity is still infinity. So uh, we kind of have this infinity over infinity form. Right, so we can go ahead and use the rule. So this is equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over, we're going to have something kind of messy down here. Uh, let's see. So this is going to be 1 half x squared plus 1 to the negative 1 half times 2x. Okay. And this 1 half and this 2 will cancel. Notice how we have a negative power here, so that's going to flip and go to the top, and then we'll have an x on the bottom. Uh, so we're going to have, looks like, the limit as x goes to infinity of the square root of x squared plus 1 over x here. And, oh, it looks like our fraction just flipped upside down. We kind of have the same problem. And actually, if you do L'Hopital's rule again, it's going to give you the original problem that we had to start with. So what do we do from here? Well, it is slightly better to work with this, right? And the reason why is because we can actually divide through by x, but we have to sort of change it a bit before we do that. Right, we have square root of x squared plus 1 over, we can change x to be the square root of x squared, right? That evaluates to x. And if we do that, we can actually divide through here, right? So, so the point is, this turns into the limit as x goes to infinity of the square root of x squared plus 1 over x squared. And this is the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over x squared inside of a square root. And now we can see what's going on, right? As x goes to infinity, this fraction is going to shoot off to 0. And then we just have the square root of 1, which is 1. Nice, 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 nice. 
Okay. <coughs> Let's maybe try this one over here. All right. And zero, uh, x is approaching zero from the positive end. All right. Um, I don't know if that makes much of a difference in this case, but I guess we'll see. So it looks like the bottom is going off to zero. And what is the top going to? Well, if this is going to zero, and if this is going to zero, then what we end up with is e to the zero minus one, which e to the zero is just a one. So yeah, the, the top part here, this whole top part is going to zero. So we have this indeterminate form for this limit. All right, let's go ahead and use the rule, right? We have the limit as x goes to zero from the positive end. The top is gonna be e to the x minus one now, right? and the bottom is gonna be three x squared. And again, right, let's check this again. Well, the bottom seems to be going to zero, and this e to the x minus one, when we start plugging in zero, we have that the top is also going to zero. So we have that indeterminate form again. Okay, well, let's use L'Hopital's rule again. This will be the limit as x goes to zero plus, and we, sh we will have, let's see, ch -ch -ch -ch. we will have e to the x over, it looks like six x. Uh, let's see, is that right? Ooh, you know what I did? I made a mistake on this problem as well. Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay, we got to keep rolling with it. Um, this was meant to be an x squared, because if you look at it, this limit diverges. Well, actually, maybe I did intend for this, right? Because I have this zero with a plus. We're approaching zero from the positive direction. So I guess I guess we can tell what's going on here. I think maybe I did intend for that. So notice what's happening, right? This bottom part is going towards, think of it as some very small positive number, right? And this top part is approaching one. So we have one divided by a very, 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 very tiny but positive value. What is the overall fraction going to turn into or approach, right? It's going to approach positive infinity. I think I did intend for that. Yeah, positive infinity. <laughs> now, if that was an x squared on the bottom, you would actually get a numerical answer, which is why I thought I might have miswrote this problem, but actually I did not. All right. Uh, here we have x times sine of 1 over x. Okay, so we kind of have something weird going on here. Uh, this is going off towards positive infinity while this is approaching zero, which means this whole function is approaching zero, right? Sine of zero is zero. So we kind of have like infinity times zero, which doesn't really meet L'Hopital's requirements. So what can we do here? Well, we can just sort of rewrite this in a slightly better way. Right? When in doubt, just rewrite the problem in a different way. So we could, we could say that this is sine of 1 over x divided by 1 over x, right? If you divide by 1 over x, it's the same thing as multiplying by x. Well, now what's going on? Well, this, this top part is going to 0, but so is this bottom part now, right? So we do have that indeterminate form. So now we can actually take a derivative here, right? Okay, so what do we got? We got the limit as x goes to infinity. Now, sine of 1 over x, this is a chain rule thing, right? We, this turns into cosine of 1 over x, and then we multiply by the derivative of 1 over x. 
which is going to be negative 1 over x squared. Um, if you don't quite believe me on that, do it yourself and then rewrite it. It should be negative 1 over x squared. And that means that this is also down here too, right? Because we already did the derivative of 1 over x, so we don't need to redo it again. And notice, in the limit, we have a hole here. And so we can basically cancel that hole out in the limit. And what do we have? We have the limit as x goes to infinity of cosine of 1 over x. Okay? Well, notice, right, this is basically, this is approaching 0. So in the limit, we're approaching cosine of 0, which is equal to what? Equal to 1. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. All right. Time for an application problem. So we have the rate of change of the sales for a company. And notice the units here are dollars per month. Right? It's modeled by the following. So this is, uh, this is supposed to be 5,000 plus 675 sine of pi over 6t. So this is one where I would expect you to use your calculator. So part A, what was the income earned? Or this part A is not supposed to be there. There we go. Part A, in the first quarter, from t equal to 0 to t equals 3. First of all, what does that even look like? Right. So think about it. What can we do with a rate to get the total amount of money earned? Right. This is a rate here. This is dollars per month. Well, we can integrate it. Right? That's the whole point of integration. So we can integrate from 0 to 3 the function. right? So that's going to be 5,000 plus 675 uh, sine of pi over 6 t dt. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. And we can actually do this integration by hand. At a certain point, you'll need your calculator, though, uh, to do the calculations. But the antiderivative is not too bad. Right? So this is going to turn into 5,000t. This other one is going to turn into, uh, so you've got to think about this, right? Uh, it's going to be negative 675 cosine of pi over 6 times t. And then to account for the chain rule, right, we need to multiply by 6 over pi, right? So think about that. Um, this is from 0 to 3. If I take the derivative of this, I should get this. And the only way for that to happen is if I multiply by this 6 over pi and by negative 1 to counteract the negative that comes from the derivative of cosine. So... You need to have both of those. Both of those are important. But that is my antiderivative. So the whole point is, um, oh, yeah, this is it's fairly complicated, right? But we have 5,000 times 3 minus 675 times cosine of 3 times pi over 6 is going to be pi over 2, and then times... 6 over pi. So that's my first term. And then minus, here's my next one, 5,000 times 0 minus 675 cosine of 0 times 6 over pi. All right, you got to have all this stuff. So now you can start putting it into your calculators or you can do some of this you can do pretty easily. All right, this cosine of pi over 2, that, that turns this whole thing into 0. So you don't even need to type that into your calculator. 5,000 times 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So really, at the end of the day, all I have is, this is going to be 15,000 in that first parentheses, minus, what do we got over here? Remember, this negative distributes, right? So it's going to affect that other term. So we have plus, oh, wait, actually, I, I didn't just, Shoot, I was going to distribute it and then distribute it again. You can only distribute it once. So we have 
zero minus six seven five <clears throat> times six over pi. And so really, whatever this is, you can put it into your calculator should be the right answer. Six seven five times six. I'll just leave it like that. I don't have a calculator with me, but you guys can check me. And remember, the units here are dollars, dollar dollar bills. All right, let me do second quarter here. Um, second quarter, same type of, well, I guess I don't really, I'll set this one up. You guys can do it yourself, but this would be the same kind of integral, but from three to six, but we're still integrating that rate there. Right, because we only want the income earned in that second quarter. It would be different if they said all the income earned up until the second quarter, but we want specifically in that quarter, right? So we only do three to six. And so, you know, y'all can do this one as well, but notice, right, if you already have the antiderivative here, that's going to be the same antiderivative there. The only thing that changes are these bounds. And so, it's basically the same problem. You're, you're just plugging in different numbers. So you'll see what the solution is in the answer key. But the point is, this was a long video. I got to go ahead and call it. So good luck on the test. Uh, good luck with your studies. And have a great day.